Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar as part of our 2021 Analytical Extravaganza. I'm Heather Jeswa, a Senior Field Sales Engineer for Shimatsu Scientific Instruments, and I'll be your moderator today. We will hear from Dr. Ina Nebit from Cleveland Clinic Foundation, and her topic is Dissecting the Impact of Gut Microbiome on Human Health by Mass Spectrometry-Based Metabolomics. Before we start, I want to share a couple of notes for our viewers. The webinar console has a variety of items to help enhance your experience and interaction with us. In the screen, you'll see the following items. The slides will, will appear on the left-hand side. Directly under the slides, you will see a resource list with clickable links relevant to the material being presented today. On the top middle is a widget for questions and answers. Please submit your questions during the presentation through this widget, and we will answer them during the Q&A session following the presentation. Just below the Q&A box are the moderator and speaker bios. You may expand the items here to learn more about us. On the right are survey questions that you may fill out anytime during or after the presentation. Finally, at the bottom panel are the icons to bring up all these widgets in case they are minimized or hidden. All right, without further ado, let's get started. Again, if you're just joining us, I'm Heather Jeswa, your moderator. Today we will be hearing from Dr. Ina Nebit, and her topic is Dissecting the Impact of Gut Microbiome on Human Health by Mass Spectrometry-Based Metabolomics. Ina Nebit is a project scientist in the Department of Cardiovascular and Metabolic Sciences at the Cleveland Clinic Learner Research Institute and an assistant professor at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Ina completed her undergraduate studies in biochemical engineering at the School of Food Technology and Biotechnology at the University of Zagreb, Croatia, and her PhD in organic chemistry at the School of Science in the same university. She received her postdoctoral training in the Department of Pathology and Department of Pharmacology at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. By using untargeted and targeted metabolomic approaches, she's working on identifying pathways contributing to the development of human diseases with a particular focus on gut microbial-derived metabolites and their impact on the host. During her career, Ina has published five book chapters and 33 papers in peer-reviewed journals, including two this year as a first and co-first and corresponding author in Cell and the Journal of Lipid Research, respectively. She also received multiple awards, including a Fulbright Visiting Research Fellowship and a Juvenile Diabetes Research International Postdoctoral Fellowship. Now, I will hand it over to Dr. Ina Nebit. Thank you, Heather, for the kind introduction. As Heather already mentioned, today I will talk about using mass spectrometry in studying impact of gut microbes on human health. In particular, I will focus today on cardiometabolic disease. One hundred trillion of one hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand distinct bacterial strains reside inside of human intestinal tract. Differences in gut microbial composition have been associated with multiple diseases, such as IBD, diabetes, and obesity, but also diseases such as depression, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. Gut microbial composition is impacted by multiple factors, and early life events such as a birth process with the vaginal versus C-section impacts later gut microbial composition but also feeding method in early childhood and then all different stresses through the life. Diet plays a very important role, for example, but also medication, geographical location, and stage in a life cycle. Gut microbes have capacity to produce and regulate production of multiple small molecules. Those molecules directly impact intestinal cells, but also via portal vein, they enter liver, where some of them go farther metabolized by the liver enzymes. From liver, gut microbes enter circulation, and from there they impact the function of distal organs. In other words, 
gut microbes resemble an endocrine organ. But unlike other endocrine organs that produce one or at most several hormones, gut microbes have capacity to produce hundreds of small molecules from entire spectrum of chemical classes. One such example is production of so-called short-chain fatty acids. Dietary fibers that come from eating whole grains, fruits, and vegetables cannot be digested by host enzymes. Gut bacteria are using those now as a source of energy, and as a result, they produce large amounts of acetic, propionic, and butyric acid, also known as short-chain fatty acids. As I said before, some of them can be used by colonocytes. For example, butyric acid is used as a source of energy. Or via portal vein, they enter liver, and from liver, they enter circulation. There are multiple mechanisms by which short-chain fatty acids impact host, and one such mechanism is interaction with free fatty acid receptors, FFA3 and 2, previously known as GPR41 and 43. Those receptors are expressed on multiple organs and tissues, such as intestinal tract, adipose tissue, pancreas, neuronal cells, and blood vessels. And then with, by interacting with short-chain fatty acids, they impact multiple functions, for example, gut mobility, insulin secretion, energy expenditure, and blood pressure. Another example is microbial fermentation of dietary choline and carnitine prevalent in Western diet. Gut microbes convert those compounds into TMA, trimethylamine, which is then oxidized by host SNO3 into TMAO. TMAO has been associated with cardiovascular disease in multiple clinical cohorts, and in animal models, TMAO and Haynes platelet hyperresponsiveness accelerated atherosclerosis and vascular inflammation led to heart failure and kidney fibrosis. Importantly, by inhibiting gut microbial enzyme, product of a CAT-C, CAT-D gene that's involved in converting choline carnitine into TMA and TMAO, it was possible to inhibit many of these phenotypes, in, at least at this moment, in animal models. Driven by these discoveries, we decided to look, is there any other gut microbial metabolites that can be associated with uh, cardiovascular disease? We look into cardiovascular disease because it's the main cause of mortality both among men and women in the United States, but also worldwide. We are also interested in looking into pathways enriched in individuals with type 2 diabetes. These decisions come from observation by Hafner and colleagues where they looked survival from coronary heart disease and showed that individuals with diabetes have similar survival rates as individuals without diabetes but previous MI while survival rates of individuals with diabetes with previous MI are much worse. In other words, diabetes itself is a risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Another bad news for individuals with type 2 diabetes is that strict glycemic control doesn't decrease incidence of stroke, MI, or death from cardiovascular disease. This has been demonstrated by multiple studies. Here I'm showing the results of one of such studies called ADVANCED. Strict glycemic control reduced incidence of microvascular events, such as nephropathy and retinopathy, but not uh, macrovascular events, such as stroke, MI, and death. So we believe that there are possible other pathways that underline cardiovascular disease in individuals with diabetes. To identify those pathways, we used untargeted metabolomics as approach. 
We took plasma for more than 1,000 individuals undergoing elective diagnostic cardiac evaluation with longitudinal follow-up and subject, subjected it to the high-resolution LCMS-MS chromatography. And as a result, we got multiple chromatograms which require data alignment and analysis. And as a result, we got a metabolic profile, which is nothing but a table with spectral features and their intensity. We took that to the next um, set of analysis, where we looked into the compounds that are associated with cardiovascular disease event risk. We also looked into compounds that are different in diabetics versus non-diabetics. And we looked into the compounds that does not correlate with glycemic control or have a very poor correlation. First, we look into the compounds that could be identified at the moment of uh, analysis. And uh, here are the top five candidates. Uh, this is a very busy table here just showing that those uh, candidates did fulfill all the criteria. So they were uh, significantly associated with major adverse cardiovascular events defined as MI stroke or death. They were significantly different in diabetics versus non-diabetics and had poor or uh, no correlation with uh, glucose control expressed as fasting glucose, AGB1C, or insulin glucose ratio. As you can see, TMAO, a compound that I mentioned before, came up very high on the, in, this, uh, in this list. Another compound right in, um, before TMAO is TML, or trimethyllysine. This is a compound that we followed up. And then we have uh, three uh, lipids from uh, phosphatidylcholine and ethanolamine uh, groups, which uh, just basically tentatively uh, determine the structure, so we didn't focus on those right now. Instead, we decided to look into the unknown uh, compounds, and we decided to look the compound from the top of the table, compound with uh, m mass over charge ratio of 265.11. Eight, eight. As I mentioned at the beginning, we are interested in looking are any of these metabolites coming from gut microbes. To answer that question, we are using plasmas from healthy individuals that were put on a regimen of a poorly absorbable antibiotics for seven days, and the main goal of that was to suppress gut microbiota. And we have plasma before and after the regimen, but also we allow antibiotics to be washed out for a minimum of three weeks and the bacteria to regrow. And then we look the level of compounds with M over Z265-1188 and so that after the uh, antibiotics, it practically disappears from circulation. And then after allowing bacteria to regrow, it comes up again, strongly suggesting that we are dealing with the metabolite from, uh, that is coming from gut microbes. And to make a long story short, we were able to identify this compound as phenylacetylglutamine. Here you are looking one of example of identification. It's comparison of high-resolution mass spec data where we are comparing compound in plasma, shown in red, versus uh, standard, shown in blue. So now, when we finalized our untargeted metabolomics, we decided to validate these findings, and we developed a triple quad mass spectrometry method, so low resolution, and used that on a cohort composed of 4,000 individuals undergoing elective diagnostic cardiac evaluation with longitudinal follow-up. So, and here are the data. As you can see, in all 4,000 subjects, phenylacetylglutamine levels in fourth versus the first quartile were significantly associated with three-year MACE risk, major adverse cardiovascular event risk, defined as MI stroke or death. And those associations were significantly 
uh, stay significant even after adjusting for multiple traditional risk factors such as age, gender, smoking, HDL, LDL, triglycerides, blood pressure, and uh, CRP. When we divided those 4,000 individuals into ones with and without diabetes, we saw that associations still uh, stay significant even in the individuals without uh, diabetes, while the associations are much stronger among individuals with diabetes. So these observed associations, they suggest that there is a potential effect on phenylacetylglutamine on platelet function and interaction with vascular matrix. So we then decided to further investigate effects of uh, phenylacetylglutamine on, uh, on platelets and uh, interaction with vascular matrix. So we first look platelet adhesion to collagen surface under physiological shear flow. For that, we use microfluidizers with cells coated with collagen. Blood was pretreated with vehicle, which in this case was saline or phenylacetylglutamine at two different concentrations, and that whole blood was perfused over the chips under the physiological shear flow. And as you can see from these uh, data, from representative images in the middle, and also from the quantification of all the data on the right, that phenylacetylglutamine pretreatment substantially accelerate the rate of collagen-dependent platelet adhesion. Next, we uh, look at the effect of phenylacetylglutamine on platelet aggregation in platelet-rich plasma in the presence of uh, different agonists. Here I'm showing data for ADP, and we having a platelet-rich plasma pretreated with phenylacetylglutamine or vehicle. And then by increasing the levels of ADP, we look at the aggregation. And as you can see, that pretreatment with phenylacetylglutamine shifts this aggregation curve to left. In other words, phenylacetylglutamine enhances platelet responsiveness. And on the right, you can see that that effect is dose dependent. We tested the other platelet agonists as well, and they show very similar results, uh, TRAP6 and uh, collagen. Next, we looked, is there any effects of phenylacetylglutamine on intracellular levels of cytosolic uh, calcium? And we saw that phenylacetylglutamine on its own does not cause any calcium release. However, in the presence of a platelet agonist thrombin, we observed those dependent increase of calcium release by increasing uh, phenylglutamine uh, levels. And on the left, you are seeing these representative images, and on the right is the quantification of all these, uh, all, of all uh, the data. So now when we saw that there is an effect of phenylacetylglutamine on platelets in vitro, we decided to look at the impact of phenylacetylglutamine on clot formation in vivo mouse model. But before we started that experiment, we went to look what are the levels of phenylacetylglutamine in mice, and we noticed that mice actually don't make phenylacetylglutamine, they make instead phenylacetylglycine, while humans predominantly make phenylacetylglutamine and they don't make too much phenylacetylglycine. And that was also confirmed by uh, IP injecting the microbial product phenylacetic acid into the mice. And as you can see over time, mice make phenylacetylglycine and very, very small amount of phenylacetylglutamine. And this was uh, consistent with the literature that uh, shown before that gut microbes ferment phenyl uh, alanine into the phenylacetic acid, which then uh, in liver gets um, metabolites in humans into phenylacetylglutamine, while in rodents predominantly into phenylacetylglycine. So once when we switch to, into these uh, in vivo models, 
we decided to test both of these uh, metabolites. To test the impact of phenylacetylglutamine and glycine on the close formation in vivo, we used ferrochloride-induced carotid artery injury model. So we first raised the level of phenylacetylglutamine and glycine by IP injection. Then we labeled platelets with fluorescence dye by injecting it directly into the jugular vein. And after that, uh, the carotid, left carotid artery was exposed and injured by placing filter paper soaked in ferric chloride. And then thrombus formation was monitored in real time by using intravital fluorescence microscopy. And here you can see on the left representative images from these analyses. And from the third from the top is injection of phenylacetylglutamine. And you can see that over time, clot forms much faster in comparison to a saline or phenylalanine. And a similar, uh, similar thing was observed when animals were IP injected phenylacetylglycine. But not only that the clot forms faster, the time uh, to sensation of flow was much shorter. And on the right, we have in charts uh, summation of all, all the data. So animals that were injected saline or phenylalanine had a low level of circulating phenylacetylglutamine and glycine, and their time to sensation of flow was significantly higher than in animals that are injected on phenylacetylglutamine, which level them went up, or phenylacetylglycine. Uh, uh, next, we looked into the bacterial side of the story, into genes responsible for production of phenylacetic acid. This was done in a collaboration with um, Michael Fischbach's group from Stanford University. They previously have described multiple involvement of multiple genes in phenylalanine fermentation by gut microbes. They discovered that phenylalanine by amino transferase is first converted into phenylpyruvic acid, and then phenylpyruvic acid can uh, go two ways. One way will, uh, beginning with a product of an FLDH gene, will end up in formation of phenylpropionic acid, while um, phenylpyruvic acid, if uh, metabolized by the product of a poor A gene, will result in formation of phenylacetic acid. So they generated uh, mutants that have one or, or lack one or both uh, genes, and send those to, to us, and then we tested them first in vitro. And indeed, if a um, uh, mutant had both functional genes, FLDH and PORA, it, it formed phenyl, uh, predominantly phenylpropionic acid. But if uh, FLDH gene was lacking in a mutant, then phenylpyruvic acid was not metabolized into propionic acid anymore, Instead, it was predominantly metabolized into the phenylacetic acid, as you can see from this uh, chart. So we are not producing any more uh, blue propionic acid, but we are getting more of this red phenylacetic acid. And also, by lacking 4A gene, uh, we are now having only phenylpropionic acid production, not phenylacetic acid. So next, we use those mutants to, go, uh, to colonize germ-free mice. So we use the mutant that can produce only phenylpropionic acid or the mutants that are producing phenylacetic acid. But in addition to lacking FLDH gene, we had those mutants also lacking CAT-C gene. If you remember the beginning of my presentation, I mentioned that CAT-C is involved in production of TMA, TMAO, which is also a prothrombotic metabolite. So we want to exclude TMAO from, uh, from equation. So after colonization, as we uh, predicted, 
the levels, which you can see on the bottom of the, uh, of the slide on the right, of phenylacetyl glycine in host that was colonized with phenylacetic production producer was much higher than the ones that are uh, colonized with phenylpropionate producer. And also from these representative images, you can see that the cloth formation was much higher in mice that were colonized with phenylacetic producer, or in this uh, summary graph where we involved all the animals and measure time to the sensation of flow, animals uh, colonized with the phenylacetate producer had significantly lower time to the cessation of flow post-injury in comparison to animals that were predominantly phenylpropionate producers. So next we want to look, can phenylacetate glutamine bind to any cellular receptors? And for that we use something called DMR, which is a short for dynamic mass redistribution. This is basically a technology, label-free technology, that allows real-time detection of ligand-dependent cellular response. The cells are grown in um, biosensor-coated uh, microplates, and those are then placed into an instrument that can measure changes in refractive index before and after the treatment with ligand, which in our case was phenylacetylglutamines. And those changes in refractive index that originate from uh, ligand-induced changes in biomass. For these experiments, we use MEG01 cells. Those are human bone marrow-derived megakaryoblasts, a culturable precursors of uh, platelets. So as you can see, adding phenylacetylglutamine to MEG01 cells resulted in a positive DMR response, and that response was similar to a non-receptor binding ligand that we use as a positive control, in this case, uh, norepinephrine. And when we used uh, phenylacetylglutamine analog, structural analog and precursor phenylalanine that's known to doesn't bind to any receptor, there was uh, no signal observed. So next we looked um, if this uh, phenylacetylglutamine-induced uh, DMR response is uh, impacted by known GPCR signaling pathway and modulators. For that, we used uh, PTX, which is short for petrosin toxin, which is known to mask activation of G-alpha-I signaling or cholera toxin, CTX, which masks activation of G-alpha-S signaling, or YM254A90, which masks G-alpha-Q signaling, or SCH, which is a global inhibitor of all three G-alpha signaling pathways. And for phenylacetylglutamine, we observed that uh, PTX and CTX can inhibit uh, uh, phenylacetylglutamine produce DMR signal, uh, while P, uh, YM did not uh, significantly reduce the DMR signal produced from phenylacetylglutamine while adding all three uh, toxins together or a global inhibitor reduced phenylacetylglutamine induced signaling. As a positive control, here we use uh, norepinephrine, and uh, in agreement with the norepinephrine signaling, the, all uh, three pathways were, were inhibited, suggesting that phenylacetylglutamine can interact uh, uh, through uh, GPCR. So then the next question is which GPCR phenylacetylglutamine interacts with, and we know that there is more than 800 distinct GPCRs within the human genome. But instead of going and testing one by one, we noticed that phenylacetylglutamine has structural similarities with catecholamines, which are known ligands for adrenergic receptors. So then we decided to look into possibility of binding of phenylacetylglutamine on uh, adrenergic receptors, and in this time we focus only on three of them that are expressed on human platelets. Those are 
alpha 2A, alpha 2B, and uh, beta 2 adrenergic receptors. So we first perform loss of function experiments by using SI RNA targeting alpha 2A, alpha 2B, or beta 2 in MEG0 cells, and, and we looked into the DMR response. And as a control SIRNA, which is a scrambled SIRNA, had no effect on the bag induced DMR response. All uh, uh, other three significantly reduced phenylacetyl glutamine induced DMR response in MEG01 cells. And then in complementary studies, we used uh, pharmacological inhibitors, ICI, which is um, uh, uh, beta 2 specific uh, uh, antagonist or propyrenol, which is a beta blocker, or R Rx, which is alpha 2 non specific inhibitor. And while none of these individually had any effect on MEG01 DMR response, uh, all three of them significantly inhibited phenylacetyl glutamine induced response. More importantly, when we use the same inhibitors in, um, in human platelet studies, while none of them had uh, effects on their own on a platelet, when uh, platelets that uh, were pretreated with phenylacetyl glutamine in the presence of the submaximal concentration of ADP, which is a platelet um, uh, agonist, those uh, inhibitors induce enhanced platelet aggregation caused with uh, phenylacetyl uh, glutamine. And we also tested can these also be replicated in vivo. So for the in vivo experiments, we first put mice on a carvedidol diet for a week. Uh, carvedidol is a known beta blocker used in a clinic. And then we raise the phenylacetyl glutamine levels by IP injection, and then again use our in vivo perichloride injury model to look uh, close uh, formation. And uh, as you can see from these representative images on the left, if, uh, as shown before, if uh, phenylacetyl glutamine is injected into the mice, Clot forms uh, faster and the occlusion time is much shorter. However, if animals were pre treated with uh, carvedidol, the uh, carvedidol on its own, when you compare saline uh, group, had no effect on the clot formation, but effect of phenylacetylglutamine on the clot formation was blocked by carvedidol. And that can be also summarized. It's also summarized on the chart shown on the right, where uh, in uh, lower time to sensation of flow was um, uh, uh, caused by phenylacetyl glutamine was uh, uh, lost if animals were pretreated with uh, known beta blocker. So to summarize this uh, large uh, story, we are able to identify a gut microbial produced product from phenylalanine, phenylacetic acid. Phenylacetic acid is produced from phenylpropionic acid via product of pore A gene. Then enters the liver. In liver, in humans, get conjugated to phenylacetylglutamine, which we showed in large clinical studies to be associated with major adverse cardiovascular events, MI stroke, or death. In in vitro and in vivo experiments, we showed that phenylacetylglutamine caused platelet hyperresponsiveness uh, and um, enhanced uh, in vivo thrombosis, and that some of these events uh, can be mediated by adrenergic receptors. If you remember the beginning of my story, I said that fiber-rich diet results in microbial production of short-chain fatty acids, which I, in general, consider to have a beneficial effects on the host. While, on the other hand, uh, Western diet, red meat-rich diet that's rich in choline and carnitine, 
food production, gut microbial production of TMAO, which is, has a bad effect on the host. And while those two effects can be relatively easily modulated by switching from a red meat to a vegetable uh, diet, I showed you now another example where we are having a compound that's produced from a protein that we cannot avoid in any diet. But in addition to metabolizing uh, compounds that are coming from our diet, microbes can also metabolize products that are produced by the host. One such example is uh, fermentation of bile acids. So bile acids are synthesized in liver by hosts from uh, cholesterol. And once synthesized, then they get conjugated to amino acid, glycine, or taurine, and then we get um, something called bile acid salts. And in the general, bile acids and bile acid salts are called primary bile acids. They are stored in gallbladder, and after food ingestions, they are released in intestine. Once in intestine, they are now exposed to gut microbes, and gut microbes can also use those bile acid salts and to produce something that we, in general, call secondary bile acids. Two major primary bile acids synthesized by human um, uh, host liver from cholesterols are cholic acid and chinodeoxycholic acid which differ only in the position of hydroxyl group on the, on the position 12. So on the uh, free carboxyl group, uh, glycine and or taurine can be conjugated, and then bile acids are formed. So in this case, we are talking about glycocholic acid and taurocholic acid, also glycochinodeoxycholic and taurochinodeoxycholic uh, acid. And so once in intestine, those bile acids then get modified by gut microbes. Gut microbes can oxidize hydroxyl group into the keto group, so we get keto bile acids or reduce it back, which then in the end cause epimerization of hydroxyl group. And another way microbes modify bile acids are by removing hydroxyl groups. But now these modified bile acids then through portal vein go back into the liver, and then in liver they can also be conjugated to glycine and taurine or even uh, sulfonated. So taking into consideration presence of three hydroxyl group and all different combinations of these uh, modifications, we are talking about a very large pool of different secondary bile acids. So here are shown all of these possible uh, combinations without even showing any uh, glycine or taurine conjugated uh, bile acids. And then in addition, if you work with in a mouse model, then you even have a more complex system because mice have a capacity of producing 6-hydroxy bile acids, so-called muracolic bile acids. As you can imagine, measuring these bile acids by mass spectrometry is not easy, mostly because most of them don't differ in mass, only in a position, for example, of a hydroxyl group. But we managed to develop a chromatographic separation pretty much of all of these uh, isomers and develop a method for bile acid measurement in uh, plasma and uh, fecal material, which now allows us to then look into the effects of bile acids on the host uh, metabolism. Similar to phenylacetylglutamine, when we had uh, samples from humans on and off poorly absorbable antibiotics, we could look into the levels of some of these secondary bile acids before and after uh, antibiotic regimen. And here, for example, one of the secondary bile acids, isodeoxycholic acid, which completely removed from circulation and goes back after the regrowth of gut bacteria. But we are noticing that some of those bile acids, for example, isolytocholic acid, is not uh, uh, getting back in the circulation where it was before the antibiotic regimen. So as I mentioned before, uh, 
primary bile acid salts are the ones that are being released into intestine. So the first step is hydrolysis or removal of glycine or taurine in the gut, and that's also done by the gut microbes. And when we look at the effects of gut microbes on the circulating level of the bile acid salts, in this case, we looked at taurochinodeoxycholic acid and taurocholic acid, and we saw that there is no effect on gut microbes on their circulating levels. However, when we looked into the circulating level of the primary three bile acids, chinodeoxycholic and cholic acid, and in particular in cholic acid, we are seeing that uh, antibiotics treatments basically remove the uh, levels uh, from uh, remove these uh, bile acids from the circulation. So even something that we uh, traditionally call primary bile acid, which is a host-produced bile acid, its circulating level is heavily impacted by the gut microbes. So we use this uh, platform to measure all of these individual bile acids in a clinical cohort that was composed of 80 diabetics and uh, age and gender matched to non-diabetics. And as you can see where each of these colors represents one of the individual bile acids, the individuals with diabetes had a significantly, had a higher levels of total bile acids, total primary and secondary, and significantly higher level of 12-hydroxy uh, bile acids. So by measuring all of these individual bile acids, we can also look at their association with diabetes, as presented in this forest plot when we compare the individuals with bile acids in fourth versus the first quartile. And when we look on the individual levels, we are noticing that deoxycholic acid, which is a secondary bile acid, and it's salt torodeoxycholic and glycodeoxycholic, are positively associated with diabetes, and they're also uh, correlating with the glucose level and the HOMA IR, which is a measure of insulin resistance. While on the other hand, uh, torohoyocholic acid and torohoyodeoxycholic acids are having negative associations. So in other words, by doing this kind of research, we can now a look into association of each individual bile acids with a certain phenotype, which in this case uh, was uh, diabetes. So why we are doing all of this? So if you remember, the very first slide from my presentation was that um, uh, different gut microbial compositions were associated with multiple diseases. And uh, not surprisingly, now more and more we are hearing a term called drugging the gut microbiome. So if we somehow can fix gut microbiome, maybe we can uh, treat some of these uh, diseases. And there are different approaches being used, like fecal transplants, probiotics, or small inhibitors, like I showed you for the CAT-C, using uh, fibers. And we think that by basically looking into these uh, gut microbial metabolites and identifying their association with the, with the host uh, physiology, we can use that as a platform for the rational design in the drug in the microbiome. So basically to inhibit production of the compounds that are not beneficial or harmful to the host and an increased production of compounds that are beneficial or not harmful for the host. So I will end up my presentation here and uh, thank to Dr. Stanley Hazen who allowed me to work uh, on these uh, projects and all the people that were involved in um, this phenylacetyl glutamine story, uh, also Ibrahim who works on this bile acid story, uh, Dr. Tang, Yuping Wu, and Mohan and Prasad from clin clinic uh, that help us with many of these studies. Also our collaborators um, from UC Davis, also from Stanford University, Michael Fischbach, uh, who was uh, helping us with all of these gut microbial studies, also Federico Ray, 
from University of Wisconsin. We help us with the germ-free studies and, of course, funding from NIH and the Duke Foundation. And we are also proud uh, Shimatsu Center of uh, Excellence at the Cleveland Clinic. And thank you for your attention. And I can take uh, questions. Let's thank Ina for such an exciting presentation. Again, under the resource list, you can find more information about our analytical solutions as well as links to a couple of Ina's publications. If you have not had a chance, please fill out the survey questions on the right-hand side to provide feedback and request additional information. We also encourage you and your colleagues to attend our upcoming webinars, which encompass a wide variety of application areas. The registration link is located at the bottom of this slide. At this time, we will begin our question and answer session. Thank you to the audience for attending and sending questions. Our first question is, have there been any longitudinal studies on how the profile of the identified bioacids might change over time? Uh, okay, so to clarify that, you know, bile acids and all of these other metabolites, they are um, uh, changing with, with meals. So when you ingest food, so the levels that, you know, like uh, you know, change like over the day, uh, depending how much food you have available in your intestine. Uh, so everything that we are doing here, we are doing uh, uh, on a... Um, uh, with uh, fasting plasmas, from individuals with the fla fasting plasmas. We personally have not looked, and I'm not aware of any literature that they're looking into prospective uh, studies into changes in the levels. Levels definitely change over time. But how and uh, in which direction, I don't know. So I, I hope that that answers uh, this, this question. Yes, thank you. Uh, another one is, what are your thoughts on eating fermented foods to improve gut microbiome? Well, uh, fermented food is known that it's rich uh, on uh, probiotics, and also fermented food is also rich on fibers, which are both uh, known that uh, help uh, you know, establish a healthy gut microbiome. Fibers, as I said in my presentations, are the source of short-chain fatty acids, which are in general considered good for us. So I would then say, personally, I think think it, it's good. Thank you. And that's disappointing. I wish red meat was full of short-chain fatty acids. Too bad. <laughs> yeah. um, another question. Based on the research, what do you think a person can do to help with their own gut microbiome? Take probiotics? diet, seek out a fecal transplant? Well, definitely diet plays one of the most important roles in the, you know, forming your gut microbiome. And as you can see, eating healthy, you know, in the end we come to always the same conclusions. Eat your fruits and vegetables and you will be okay. And then less these uh, uh, Western type of diets, fried food and uh, red meat rich diet. Uh, so... So that was the. What was the second part of the question? Should it, should you take probiotics or or seek a fecal transplant? Okay, so uh, probiotics. There is like a lot on the you know market. A lot of things are being you know advertised. I personally don't know much about it, and I do not want to say yes or no. Just be careful, you know, because many of these products are just you know. Many of these don't even survive the the digestive tract to even engraft into the into the intestine. So when it comes to the fecal transplant, that's something that you know there is also debate that's really done with the people who are having very serious uh, uh, health issues and needs to be done in the control system, and it, that's not an easy easy performance either because in some people that works very well and some does not. And you can always, you know, when it comes to the fecal transplant, in addition to transferring good bacteria, you can also, there is always a risk of transferring some pathogens, which was the one in a recent example. So that can be done, but that needs to be done in controlled conditions. And I don't think that that's approved for everyday people to do it. 
um, was any distinction made between the types of diabetic patients, type 1, 2, gestational, that you profiled? So uh, the individuals that we have in our cohorts, uh, those are type 2 diabetes. Okay. Other than, di this ties into some of the other questions, other than diet, what would you expect to be the most important factors in affecting your gut metabolome? So definitely early childhood. This is now something that we are learning. Uh, that uh, that's something that definitely defines the microbiome in a, a later stage. And now being blamed for so many allergies and obesity that we are seeing among uh, children. Uh, I would say also medication, in particular antibiotics. As you can see, like for one example that I show in the bile acids that what you have before and after antibiotic treatment did, was not the same. So they are definitely modulating our microbiome. Wow. Um, does phenylacetylglutamine, excuse me for pronouncing that wonky, affect other organs in the body and increase risk of other health conditions? Uh, so uh, most probably yes. As I did in my presentation, showed you that uh, Phenylacetyl glutamine can possibly interact with adrenergic receptors, and adrenergic receptors are virtually expressed in almost every single uh, cell or tissue in our body. So we definitely are expecting that we will look into more or uh, into different effects beyond uh, the platelets and thrombosis. But this is where we started. So definitely in heart, we are expecting uh, that phenylacetyl glutamine will play a role. Mm -hmm. On slide 14, I know we can't necessarily go back. Can you comment on how the hazard ratio is adjusted for age? Do the diabetic so subjects? Oh, go ahead. So we uh, do our hazard ratio. So we use these multi-regression models. So we basically then include age of population, or there are yes/no to like a phenotype, like yes/no to diabetes, or we put their like LDL or HDL levels include into the model. So that's how we do adjust. So what was the second part about diabetics? Um, it, it says, does, it, does the 1,261 diabetic subjects include both type 1 and type 2 diabetic patients? So so I already answered it's yep. only yeah, type 2, yes. Okay. Um, during the untargeted metabolomic analysis step, how many unknown ions did you find that were qualified as compounds of interest? So we, uh, it's, you know, it was some time ago, but we have in general roughly about uh, a thousand overall, where we had like uh, uh, between two to three hundred of a known compounds, and the rest were unknown. Hmm. Were any of those unknowns peptides or proteins? So this was done on a helix column. Uh, I. Um, Personally, didn't look into all of these unknowns because I first filter, as I explained in the beginning, uh, that we look something that's enhanced in, in uh, diabetics that uh, tracks with the cardiovascular risk and then doesn't track with the uh, glycemic control, so I narrowed down. Among those, I did have uh, seen several that could be uh, peptide-like structures, but small peptides like D-peptides or tripeptides. Got it. And the final question we have is, what software did you use for data alignment and analysis in the untargeted analysis? So this particular analysis was done on the ABCX triplet of high resolution mass spec. So it was done by using their uh, their uh, software. So in this case, that was MultiQuant. And then uh, MZMine and other databases were used for the compound uh, identification. Great. Thanks, Ina, again, for such a great presentation. And it looks like we've reached the end of our questions. So um, if you have remaining questions that you didn't ask in the chat or during this, please feel free to contact us, and we will get them answered for you. Once again, thank, thank you. you to everyone for attending and participating. And we'll send you an email with a link to re view the recorded version of this presentation anytime. And once more, we encourage you and your colleagues to attend our upcoming webinars, and the registration link is at the bottom of this slide. Have a great day, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.